Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SIE Corporate Partners SALTOS webinar on wired and wireless access control fundamentals. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. And by default, the control panel is located on the right hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this web webinar will be made available on the SIE YouTube channel, SIREE TV, under the Corporate Partnership Playlist. This channel is updated regularly, so ensure check back as often as possible for new uploads. A link of this uh, SIE TV um, appears in the chat function. Please click on it and subscribe. It is free. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'd like to now introduce you to our first speaker, Mr. Roger Birch, who is a technical lead for Salto System Africa. With a combined experience of 16 years in access control, Roger worked for some of the largest access control manufacturers in South Africa, joining Salter Systems SA in 2015 as a technical lead for Sub-Sahara Africa. He has extensive knowledge in solution consulting, training, technical writing, and technical support across verticals such as education, mining, retail, corporate, healthcare, and shared living, and working environments utilizing on-premise mobile and cloud-based solutions. I hand you over now to Roger. Thank you, Mintz. Um, good day to everyone and welcome to this brief introduction to SALTO and some of the world-class access control solutions uh, we provide in a vast range of verticals um, and markets in today's world. Um, so I'm going to start off by just giving you a bit of a background of, um, of who SALTO is and where we operate. Uh, we are an electronic access control manufacturer based in the small town of San Sebastian in Spain, where we manufacture all of our access control solutions uh, in-house. Um, we have SALTO offices in over 30 countries around the world, but we have a footprint in over 90 countries. And this is made possible by our inspired business partner network around the world that supply, install, and support these uh, solutions in their own respective countries. Okay, so our, our smart access control solutions um, are maintenance free, they're wireless free, and they are wireless um, and compatible with almost any type of existing lock standard available um, in today's world. Um, our platform can be either cloud based or it can be an on premise solution, um, but both will give you the ability to manage and control access to your businesses um, and multi site businesses. Uh, from anywhere in the world using your smartphone or any web-enabled device like a tablet or a PC, um, etc. Um, so inspiration, dedication and passion have led Salter to become the fifth largest access control manufacturer in, in the world. And this is in a little over than, uh, than 10 years. Um, our production facility is fully automated um, using the just-in-time order delivery system. Um, and we also do manufacture to specific orders. Um, we have a manufacturing cap uh, capacity of around 750,000 units um, annually. Okay, so the next slide that I'm going to show you is just um, a couple of reference sites so you know what kind of spaces um, SALTO actually plays in. So the first one we're gonna take a look there is, um, is education. Um, and SALTO has a very good fit in this vertical. Um, and really any, any vertical where you've got a lot of people using a lot of doors, like a, a student campus. Um, so, so normally, you know, with, with uh, other existing access control systems, you do get limitations as to the amount of people or amount of doors you can have on a system. Um, with Salter, this is not the case. So 
uh, we're able to, to put 4 million people through a one specific uh, lock or a door handle or a discussion as we refer to them. Um, and I'll show you a little bit later on what these, uh, what these discussions look like. So very good fit for any place that's got a lot of people using a lot of doors. Um, so just to, um, I've mentioned Stellenbosch University <clears throat> um, there on the slide, but we also uh, do universities like uh, Nelson Mandela University, um, uh, UWC, um, and a couple of others. Right, then uh, also in the transport uh, vertical, so Heathrow Airport, Munich, which is actually one of our, one of our largest SALTO sites around the world. Um, and then also commercial buildings. Um, just to mention a few there, T-Mobile um, HQ in Vienna is a, is a beautifully designed building. We've got access control there from Salto, and then also the Coca-Cola Africa HQ in, uh, in Port Elizabeth. Once again, a beautiful building, um, top-notch building, and they are using um, our Justin Mobile application uh, to access all of their doors on that site. Okay, so then just a couple of references in government. Um, obviously, these are all uh, overseas. Um, our government has run out of money. <laughs> uh, and then also in the healthcare sector as well. So we found a good health, uh, a fit in the healthcare sector. Currently, we're working with the Netcare Group in South Africa um, to provide them access control for the, the uh, medication and drug cabinets. So um, for their hospitals, when the patients are in their wards or in their rooms, they have their own specific locker that they keep their medication in. Um, and we manage this for them, um, giving them a track record of who went into these cabinets um, and at what time. All right, and then we've obviously got a very good fit in the hospitality sector, um, but just keeping in mind that ever since SALTA was created in 2001, it was always intended uh, and it was started up as an access control company. So later on, with the, the look and feel of our access control products, we also found that we've got a very good fit in the hospitality market. Um, and just to just to name a few, there's a couple here in South Africa, the Leonardo, uh, the Saxon, um, and these are all world-class um, hotels that use our access control products um, at the moment. All right, then um, another vertical that I just want to touch on is um, your shared working spaces and actually also shared living spaces, um, where you're looking at um, you know global companies like like the Regis Group or IWG. Um, that offer temporary or long-term uh, office space rentals. Um, you know, adding ex SALTO access control to these buildings allows them to, to, to manage the keys and manage the access to rental spaces um, and meeting rooms and things like that a lot easier, um, especially if, you know, you, you don't need to give the person a physical credential to en enter that room. Uh, basically, what they do is they can send a mobile key to the to the the, the person's phone, uh, and they can then access those spaces with their mobile device. Okay, retail. So I've made mention there of Canal Walk in Cape Town that uses uh, Salto in their in their centres, um, and then we've also got a couple of reference sites for big big banking institutions um, around the world. Okay, so the smart access control that we refer to, let's take a look at some of these um, smart devices um, and the doors that they're able to secure. So we have a range of door handles. You'll see this one over here, the electronic uh, door handle, or we refer to them as discussions. Um, and this can pretty much replace your standard lock and key scenario, either using the existing mortise lock, and the mortise lock is the actual lock that sits inside the door, um, or you can upgrade that, that existing mortise lock to a SALTO lock. Now, um, obviously, there's, there's a couple of advantages when you're upgrading the, the mortise lock in the door itself. Uh, SALTO's mortise locks are, are intelligent, and they do have a couple of safety features built into them, like a door monitoring sensor, so you can see whether the door is open or closed. Um, and then also, it has um, a fire rating. Uh, so the locks range from half an hour to an hour, uh, fire rating capabilities uh, for those mortise locks. Okay, the, right next to that, um, you'll see that we have um, cylinder locks. So these cylinder locks, um, uh, of, it's a quick and very easy way to secure a door that used to take a, a mechanical key. Um, the installation is very, very quick. So you simply remove the existing cylinder, 
that was in the door and you replace it with a Salter electronic cylinder and immediately you'll be able to get that door on live and get real time events in under five minutes. So the installation process is really, really easy. Um, and then to the right of that, you'll see that we also have wired readers and peripherals. Now, even though we claim we're, we're, a, we're a company that gives wireless wire free access control systems, there are just some instances where you can't get away from a wired solution. Um, and these controllers and wall readers give you the ability to manage things like sliding gates, um, boom gates, uh, lift control to, to, to only be allowed to go to certain floors, um, and then also long range vehicle access options. So these devices are all Bluetooth and NFC um, and are able to be accessed by the user's smartphone as opposed to a physical credential like a card or a, or a tag or something like that. All right, so the first device that I'm going to take you through is the, the XS41 Escussion. Um, and the XS41 Escussion is available in either a, a standalone version or it can be wireless online in real time. Uh, these are battery operated locks running on three AAA batteries with a lifespan of around 40 to 50,000 openings. So this brings down the cost of your maintenance down uh, considerably. So as an example, um, if you used uh, a standard 12 volt 7 amp power supply with a 12 volt 3 amp battery, the power usage on the ESCOM tariffs um, per year is definitely more than replacing a set of 40 Rand batteries, you know, once a year. Um, but keeping in mind that, you know, uh, even the 12 volt battery needs to be replaced either annually or biannually. Um, and, and this is usually at, at quite a considerable cost. So, and, and another difference between these, these two types of systems is that when the power fails on those conventional access control systems, or the power runs out on that 12 volt power supply that you put down, um, you know, the, the power runs out and it can't keep the lock closed anymore. Whereas with the Salter devices, whether it's the, the discussion or the, the geo cylinder, um, they will stay locked even if the batteries are completely flat and, and run down. Okay, so it will keep that door secure. All right, the next um, lock that we're going to look at, and the reason why I'm going through these locks is because these are the, the, the most popular locks uh, we find in the SA market. So the next one over here is the XS4 Mini. Um, the XS4 Mini is typically for, for indoor use, like, your, uh, like offices and shared living or working spaces. Um, and it has a very minimalistic design. So you've got the reader on the outside um, and on the inside of the door, basically all that you see there is, um, is a handle. So it's got the same battery usage and performance um, and abilities as the XS4 One, just in a more compact, smaller design. Um, and these locks are also available in offline and wireless online with mobile and card options for this, um, for this lock as well. Okay, then just a couple of other options um, in our range. Um, so the first one that you see there is our, uh, our XS4 original. This is our original range of discussions. These discussions have been around ever since um, Salto was was uh, started up in, in 2000 and 2001. Um, and that design has pretty much stayed the same all throughout uh, out the years. Um, so uh, the one that you see right next to it there is um, our, uh, our glass door lock. And this is perfect for if you're trying to um, control access to a frameless uh, glass on glass type of a door without having to install unsightly wiring and trunking and magnetic locks and things like that. Um, and this keeps to the, the aesthetics of the door. So right next to that, you'll see we've got a, a panic bar or emergency exit uh, solution as well. Um, and, and by adding Salto equipment to that, and we're gonna talk about that, that a little bit later on in the next slide, um, you increase the ability of any current fire escape that you have. Um, and, and I'll explain how we get there just now. And then right next to that, you'll see that we have a keypad discussion. So this is a normal discussion with the addition of a keypad to it. And this is generally used for a higher level of security where you need uh, multi-authentication. 
So you could, for instance, maybe use your mobile device using uh, your Bluetooth um, and you would scan it on the door and then it would require you to then put a PIN code in as well to, to, to validate that access. All right, so like I was saying earlier, um, adding Salto to um, an existing panic bar or panic or emergency exit device uh, gives you the ability to monitor this door state wirelessly, um, but you will also then be able to perform an emergency open mode uh, in case of a fire. Um, so for instance, if this is linked to, or if there's a Salto controller linked to a fire panel, the moment the fire panel triggers an alarm, we then send out a, a, a wireless message to all of the, the wireless doors on site to unlock or maybe just all of the perimeter doors um, and it can be remotely triggered so in the event of a fire you know this door can be accessed from the outside as well for the emergency teams to get into the into the the, um, the premises so you'll see uh, the panic bar devices it's a standard panic bar device it's just got a half a Salto discussion on the outside. And by adding this half, half an discussion, you also give that fire door now the ability to be monitored online so that you can make sure at the end of the day when everybody leaves um, that all of these fire doors are also closed because often uh, these doors are forgotten. Um, it's normally a smoker's <laughs> exit. Um, and this obviously creates a big hole in the security for the business. All right, and then we're going to take a look at our uh, Salto Geo cylinders and Neo cylinders. Um, so our cylinders are very versatile and have many applications um, from server rack solution. So you'll see the first example is a server rack solution. Um, and then right below that is, uh, is a key switch option. So these key switches, uh, typically you will see them in, um, in factories and uh, in big businesses where they control things like um, uh, roller shutters doors um, and, and, and other things that need electronic contact for them to open and close. Um, so and, and then just to the right of that you'll see that we've got uh, cabinet lockers as well as um, very robust wireless padlocks uh, that can be either standalone um, uh, or online but in a, in a standalone mode when it is accessed the event is actually sent through the user's phone back to the software. So even though that padlock is sitting on a farm gate um, on a game farm out in the middle of nowhere, the moment somebody accesses that lock using their mobile device, it uses a small little bit of data on that person's phone to send that transaction back to the software. So even though it's out in the sticks, you will still get lifetime transactions back uh, from those places where you've got no power or network infrastructure. All right, then we've also got hardwired solutions. Like, like I said earlier on, we, we are a, we, we focus on wireless, wire-free um, access control, but in some cases, like I said, you just can't get um, away from the hardwired stuff. So our hardwired readers are IP66 bitted readers, meaning they are waterproof, um, and come with or without a keypad and have Bluetooth and NFC technology uh, built into them, meaning that you can comfortably, comfortably control a sliding gate um, at a distance without having to roll down your window and presenting a card to the boom gate reader. Um, another option for vehicle access is our UHF long distance reader that you see there in the middle um, and, and, and that can read either a sticker that's sitting on your, your car's window um, or in some cases I mean we've got a dual technology card that that reader will be able to comfortably read out of your pocket while you're sitting in your car and you approach the, the boom gate. All right, and then next to that, you'll see we've got our XS4 controllers. Um, so our XS4 controllers can also either run online or offline. Um, now, in an offline state, you can control a vehicle barrier or a turnstile that has absolutely no network connection. Um, or you can access 128 relays or 128 floors if you're doing an elevator control um, solution with no need to run a network cable um, to the moving lift cart. So often this is quite a headache. And because of the way we control access and use the card for the access control, um, we actually write the access control plan to the card. 
um, we don't need a constant connection to that controller to update access rules on the controller itself. We just basically update the user card so those controllers can, can be in an offline state and give you the same functionality um, as if it were online. Okay, we also offer um, locker box solutions um, or, well, the, these, these are typically installed on, on uh, lockers, but they can also be used for drawers and cupboards um, and cabinets. Um, and when they are in a, a locker type of a scenario, um, they can be managed in a free assignment mode, meaning that you don't actually have to go and manage this bank of lockers and assign a static locker per person. Um, so in a free assignment mode, this will work on a first come first serve basis where if any locker is open, it will be available for you to use. And the next day you can use a different locker. So it goes. Um, these units are also, um, also come out standard or by default with a bio coat coating burnt into the plastic. Um, so a bio Biocoat is an antimicrobial coating that uses um, silver ion nanotechnology uh, for the control and spread of bacteria on the lock itself. So this coating can also be added to any of our other discussions or cylinders that I previously showed um, as an optional extra. All right, and then uh, SALTA is compliant with the Lloyd's Register of Quality Assurance, um, ISO 9001 and 14001 standards. Um, and are also committed to environmental sustainability in the design and manufacture, but also in the energy usage um, and real-time battery modern monitoring system. So, and, and this, this allows us to increase the time between um, the battery changes of the locks. So we can pretty much run those batteries down until they are really, really flat before we need to change them. And a nice thing about that is because we use alkaline batteries, uh, these batteries are easily disposable, not like uh, your lithium batteries where you need to dispose of it in a, sp a specific way. Um, we also then do offer uh, wireless, wire-free energy saving devices as well. Um, and this will allow, well, this will automatically turn off air conditioners um, and lights um, if no motion has been detected um, in a set period of time for um, a specific room. All right, so uh, that, that's it for the introduction. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. I hope you found this information uh, informative. And uh, if you require any additional information or you've got any further questions, um, you can reach out to us at info.za at saltersystems.com. Uh, once again, thanks for joining and I hope you uh, enjoy the following webinar on the fundamentals of wide and wireless access control systems. Thank you, Roger. Right, good day, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I will be your host for today's webinar. My name is Roger Birch, and I am the technical lead for uh, Salto Systems in Africa. Okay, so the, the aim or the purpose of today's webinar is to make you aware of the different types of access control that, um, that could exist on any given site, and, uh, and then to discuss the difference between wired, wireless, cloud, and mobile solutions when it comes to access control solutions themselves. Okay, so let's start off by um, defining what access control actually is. Okay, so access control is the process of identifying a person and determining their level of security access to either electronic systems or physical sites based on the policies and procedures set by that organization. Now, modern access control systems identify a person, um, authenticate them by looking at their identification, and then give that person only the key or the access rights to the door or digital resources um, that they need access to. So access is generally granted uh, using a set of steps to make sure that the user can access the requested um, uh, resources um, and these steps are typically as follows. Okay, so the first one we have is identification. So, you know, by definition, um, it is the recognition that something or someone actually exists. 
Okay, then we've got um, authentication, which is the process or action of proving or showing something to be true, valid, or genuine. So, for instance, um, if you give me your passport or your ID document, I can then authenticate who you say you are by the use of this document. Right, and then the third thing we're going to take a look at is the authorization. Um, and this is the function of specifying access rights or privileges um, to certain areas and resources. And more formally, to authorize is to actually define an access policy. Okay, so, so once the person is identified through authentication, they will then have the authorization to areas and resources based on the company or the access control policies that are in place for that institution. Okay, so what type of access control um, is out there and, and what is the real difference between them? Um, okay, so the two that we're going to be taking a look at today um, is uh, physical access control and logical access control. Um, but in this session, we'll, we'll focus more on the physical aspect. Um, so the physical access control or the use thereof um, is, is, to con is, is a matter of who, where and when. Okay, so access control systems determine who is allowed to enter or exit, where they are allowed to enter or exit, and when they are allowed to enter or exit. Now, historically, this was always partially accomplished through uh, keys and locks, but there was no uh, recorded history of this. So you can never see who went in, where, when, and, and for how long they were there for. So basically, anybody with a key that was paired to a specific lock uh, can open it at any time they choose with no way of knowing who's accessed that area or door and often who actually still has a key for it. Um, okay, so we're going to take a look then at the use of our logical access control system. Um, so the, the goal of the access control in a logical um, system is to minimize the risk of unauthorized access to these systems. Now, most organizations have infrastructure and procedures um, that limit access to networks, computer systems, applications, uh, files and sensitive data uh, that you may have, such as you know, person, personally identifiable information and intellectual property for the company. Now, um, there is an act in, in, in South Africa that exists, which is the Poppy Act. It's the protection of personal information. And then you also do have the the, the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, and the terms and conditions of both of these, of these, these acts impact um, technology and processes and, and the way in which employee and client uh, information is stored and safeguarded. Now, um, should the security measures in place be breached and personal or company information is stolen or leaked, the institution may be held liable um, as well as face the possibility of FD fines. Now, um, in both your physical and logical access control, um, the rules and laws of the person, the protection of personal information um, applies to both of them. Okay, so with your physical and logical access control systems, there is a, a, a possibility to integrate them. And the question you may ask is, well, are there any benefits in integrating systems like this? So the integration of your physical and logical security provides the benefit of simplifying the user management while um, increasing the security. So it also then ensures that um, any changes to a user's profile are updated in all the other systems without any delays. Now, um, data integrity is a critical uh, requirement for any organization, um, especially with numerous departments um, all sharing data or adding data to a shared platform. For instance, you know, should I add a new user to the physical access control system um, and his details differ from what I have for that user on the, the HR or the payroll system, um, when sharing this data on these platforms, there may be a mismatch leading to, for example, non-payment of a user's hours work because the ID number or the employee number that is sent to the HR system from the access control system don't match uh, the employee's details. 
Now, in the case of an integrated system, um, security is often managed by the IT staff with the benefit of reducing a requirement for, the, for an extra staff member to manage the access control systems. Um, integration also has the benefit of increasing security, um, such as restricting logical access to software platforms, shared drives and servers, if no, no physical access has been granted. So in, in an access control scenario, um, I will not be able to use my credentials to log on to um, a server or a shared folder unless I've gone through the main gate access control point and, and I am seen as being um, on site. Okay. All right, so, so before we take a look at the different solutions or options out there, um, keeping in mind that there are various factors to take into account before deciding on a solution, um, let's just first look at the different options for granting access in any integrated type of environment where we've got the physical and logical um, access control systems. Okay, so our access control models that we use um, will determine how someone will grant um, the right level of permissions to an individual so that they can perform their daily duties. And this is whether it be physical or logical, either or. Um, so your access control models define how permissions are assigned. So the first one we'll take a look at there is mandatory access control. Um, and in the mandatory access control, only the system owner manages the, uh, the, the access control for a user. The end user has no control over any of the privileges that they've been assigned. Um, then we've got a role-based access control, which provides um, access based on the position that an individual has in an organization. So an example of this is obviously if you've got a data capture clerk, um, they will have very limited access to a system or they will have very limited physical access to the site. Um, as opposed to a GM or a CEO or something like that. Then we've got um, a rule-based access control, which is dynamically assigned roles to users based on the criteria defined by an owner or a systems administrator. Um, and then obviously we've got the least restrictive model, which is discretionary access control, which allows individuals to, uh, which allows individuals complete control over, over anything they might, have, might own or have access to. Okay, so um, before deciding on, on the physical access control solution or before determining what type of a system is best for your business, there are eight fundamental questions you need to cover uh, to distinguish this. Okay, so the first one there, are there benefits and is it actually worth the cost? So um, many businesses and institutions see access control as a bit of a grudge purchase, but um, at the end of the day, if this is correctly configured and deployed, access control systems can not only eliminate your external risks and threats, but can also improve the, efficient, the efficiency um, and employee accountability with the costing of these systems dependent on the level of security that you, that you need for the site. Okay, so the burning question, what do you secure? Um, now, in most institutions, there are areas that are more sensitive than others, um, and that may contain important private information, valuables or items, stock and machinery, um, as, as well as general security to ensure employee and employer well-being and, and safety. Now, uh, typically on a site, your internal doors are not seen as essential to control, and more often, Focus is aimed at the perimeter to address the direct threat coming from outside of the property. Well, well that and the fact that controlling each and every door within uh, the institution is often very costly. Now, with the arrival of um, your wireless, wire-free, battery-operated locks um, and the cost saving that they bring, uh, with the ability to run online, semi-online, it now gives you the option to secure um, uh, the most of the doors to ensure all round security or, or where that security is most needed. Now, in the, the, the era of um, shared space rentals um, that are becoming more prevalent um, in today's times, there is a requirement emerging to be able to secure more individual spaces, 
meaning uh, more doors at a higher cost. And this is obviously to the detriment of the building owner um, or the service provider. But at the end of the day, it is their responsibility to ensure the safety and security of tenants and their belongings. Um, so a mitigation of risk factor for each area has to be taken into account when deciding which doors to control and which doors and areas not to. Okay, so um, the next one we've got there is what forms of authentication um, and how many do we need? So uh, we explained authentication a little bit earlier on um, and there are numerous um, authentication methods that can be used in, in access control. Uh, and, and factors that will determine this are things like the convenience, um, the security of that credential that, you, that you're planning to use, the ability of it or the capacity, um, and then the accuracy and, and the, the level of authentication that it provides. Okay, so some options to consider are things like um, your car technology that is used, um, bearing in mind that there are more secure um, solutions than others. Uh, but they do, however, come at a higher cost. And you've also got to take into account that this is also a recurring cost to the business. Okay, so a couple of forms of these credentials are things like um, smart cards and key fobs. And then you can also get various um, wearables in, in bracelet form and silicon rubber bracelets and things like that. Now, in combination, um, multiple credentials can be used for a multi-factor authentication. Um, and that increases the security level. So we will take a little uh, look at this um, a little bit later on, um, and I'll give you an example of what the, the multiple, uh, the multi-factor authentication um, entails. Okay, so um, uh, what kind of a reader should you use? Now, normally this isn't really an issue, um, but obviously in your guys' line of work where you where, where everything um, you know uh, uh, gives to the aesthetics of the building and the door, um, this is definitely a factor that 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 you would be thinking of. So, what kind of a reader should you use? Now, all depending on the access point, um, where it's located, and what it needs to do. So, for example, to to drive a magnetic lock or to send a contact to a controller to open a gate, um, or if it's a fire escape. So, all of these things will determine the type of reader that uh, you would need to, to facilitate the desired outcome for that, for that access point. Um, for things that need a relay or, or a contact, you would need a, a wall reader and a controller-based solution or a wired solution. Um, and for standard doors, uh, your internal doors and office doors and things like that, you could use something like a discussion handle, um, uh, electronic uh, handle, um, and for gates and, and server racks and cupboards and drawers and things like that, you then often need to replace the existing cylinder that's, that's within um, that door. Okay, so all depending on the door you want to secure, um, and if you are using the existing locking me mechanism um, inside that door, um, these are all factors that will determine the reader type and the functions that it's able to provide you. Okay, so um, another question to be asked is, is what kind of a lock should you use? So um, the lock referred to here is actually the locking me mechanism that's used to keep the door or access point locked. Now, these can either be um, electronic or mechanical. Okay, so the electronic locks can either be a magnetic lock, um, a strike type lock that you would see in the, in the door frame, um, or an electronic deadbolt. Um, but these locks often need continuous power um, to keep the lock working. So when you look at, at a mechanical lock or a mortise lock, as it's commonly known, um, these locks don't use any kind of electricity um, and normally requires human intervention to lock and unlock um, the device. So your, your mortise locks work with either um, a latch or a deadbolt, um, or a combination of both. Um, and typically these, these types of mortise locks and things are found um, inside the door, um, cupboards and gates and things like that. Okay, so, so another question is, what do you need at the door besides a reader and a lock? Because, I mean, this is often what, what is seen by anybody else 
they see a reader and, and, and well, sometimes they don't see the lock at all. So basically all they see is the reader. Um, but once again, this, this all depends on the door itself um, and on the construction thereof. But typically, there are many other elements needed for access control points, a, a wide access control point like this than normally meets the eye. So these things are often, le often um, hidden uh, for one good reason, <laughs> that they, they're often very unsightly and it affects the aesthetics of, of the door. Um, so we're going to take a look at um, a couple of these examples a little bit later on as well. Okay, so how do we then connect the reader to the network? Um, so herein lies the big difference um, of a wired and a wireless system. Um, it's the way that they connect to the network or to access the uh, to, to the network or the access control software from, um, from the door itself. And we'll take a look at a couple of examples later. Right, and then you've also got the, the question, you know, what type of an access control management system uh, uh, should you use? Um, should you use a local system um, that is an on-premise solution um, or a cloud-based solution? So, and here too, there's um, vast benefits for, for both. And they have um, a very, dis both of them have a very different, or very different in the aspect of the, the management of a system like that and the maintenance um, involved in a system like that. Okay, so so let's do let's compare it a little bit, and and we we're going to do a comparison between a um, a wired system and a a wireless system, just so that we've got a very good idea of the difference um, between the two. Okay, so a a wired or hardwired system, and typically we refer to this as your conventional access control system. There are many of these systems out there, and they work pretty much the same. Okay. So these conventional access control systems have they've been around for a very long time and um, have been the only real option that we've had to key replacements in the past. So uh, these systems are, however, sometimes very difficult to install um, and retrofit to existing doors as cable runs are often needed to be hidden within the door frame or uh, you know, they require a network or power infrastructure um, so often these things are provided by a third party um, that is obviously certified to carry out this type of work. So, um, you know, depending on where the door is situated, you would always need um, a PowerPoint or a network point um, at those doors. Now, there are also limitations to the types of doors that you can secure this way. <clears throat> As the, the locking mechanisms associated, associated with these wired systems um, are, are generally bulky and you do require, like I said, you do require a network uh, or power source um, very nearby. So, you know, like, like with the newer generation of wireless systems, uh, wired systems can still be remotely controlled, um, allowing the user to log into an app from a mobile phone, tablet or a PC. So this thing provides you uh, real-time information about who's entering which location, um, and when, and also who's been denied access. Um, so, and you can do this all with ever having to set a, a foot in the building. So this does, however, require some form of a VPN or a local network um, that you need to access to be able to access the database uh, remotely, unlike a cloud-based system uh, where you can just connect to the system uh, remotely into a cloud server. Um, okay, so since these systems are wired um, and they are powered externally, they are sometimes prone to uh, loss of power um, and a surge in power. And I think as South Africans, uh, we know both of these scenarios all too well, the no power and too much power at times. Okay, so, so just looking at the diagram that I've got there, um, you will see there are additional elements needed to secure a wired door other than just the reader and controller. Um, and you're looking at things like your power supply, um, but uh, generally a door like that, um, because of healthy, health and safety regulations, on the inside of the door, you will require an emergency break glass. Um, yeah, you need things like, uh, you know, the conduit, uh, the cabling that you have to uh, hide within the conduit to make it nice and neat, network point power supply, all of these things. Um, you, you need additional to the wall reader and the controller. And they also come at an additional cost as well. 
Okay, so we're going to take a look at a bit of a cost comparison um, from a wireless to a wired system as well, just to give you an idea um, of how that affects the pricing at the end of the day. Okay, so um, this diagram is showing you um, uh, what a wireless system looks like. So your wireless systems are um, are proving to work with pretty much any or, or most of today's access control systems. So it's no surprise that they're um, quickly becoming an, an attractive alternative to our traditional hardwired solutions. Um, so there are benefits for both your integrators or your installers um, and the end user. Um, from the end user standpoint, wireless access control systems deliver the same kind of benefits as wired ones without the cost of the hard wiring of the system and the junkie and everything else that goes with it. Um, and for the integrator or the installer, um, that means much less time spent on site uh, doing this installation. Okay, wireless readers are also not limited to only secure doors. Um, as wireless solutions exist for exit devices, uh, gates, elevators, padlocks, uh, data or server, in a server cabinets, and even gym lockers. So you can see on my, on my little uh, diagram, I've got um, a couple of door handles, and then I've also got a couple of cylinder locks as well. So the cylinders, basically, it's a European profile. Um, anywhere where you've got a cylinder like that, you can basically fit an electro electronic lock. Um, and fitting one of these things takes you less than five minutes and the access control is secured on that door. Okay, so there is a significant cost saving um, also on a wireless system in not only the hardware aspect, because there is a cost saving on the hardware itself, um, but also from an installation time um, with options of using the existing mortise lock uh, that's inside the door. So that means that you only basically replace the door handle um, and then you can install a wireless access point for communication between the door handle um, and the software. And that is no more difficult or time consuming than plugging in a standard uh, uh, wireless router or access point. It's, it's really easy to install. Those devices are generally PoE, um, so they get their power from the network cable. So basically, you don't need um, IT or network infrastructure um, right at the door, you basically just plug that, that uh, gateway in on a cable and run that all the way to the switch. Okay. Uh, what's nice about a system like that is that instead of using one IP address for a controller that controls maybe two doors, um, this device or this gateway device, um, you can run a total of 112 doors online, fully online and live off of one IP address. Okay. Right, so let's take a look at um, a commercial comparison between the two. So the first example that we have there is a hardwired system. And this requires a little bit more than just a reader and a lock. So as you can see there, all of these additional elements are needed uh, to make a solution like this work. Um, so these are all the things that, that, that I just mentioned before. Um, and then also just to keep in mind that, you know, with an installation of a door like this, there are, there are some elements that are out of your control um, as an installer. Um, things like the power and the network that is needed for those points. Um, you know, 90% of the time, this is something that is outsourced. Um, and and your, the installation of this project would depend on the installation of their access points and their power points. Okay, so, so taking a look at the costing, um, I put a costing in there of around 13000 for a door. Um, uh, I feel this is still um, a, a very, very low price. They go anything between 13 and 15 grand. Um, also, obviously, depending on all of the additional hardware that you need. And then the installation time of a door like this is normally about three to four hours. Okay. So if we go and compare that with a wireless um, access control system, we get exactly the same type of functionality from the wireless door as what we get from the hardwired door. Except you can see there's a huge cost saving, firstly, in the hardware itself, and the installation time, um, there's a huge cost saving. 
Um, especially when you are retrofitting something like this to a door. Let's say, for instance, the handle that you see there. Um, if you should retrofit this to an existing door that already has a mortise lock inside, um, it's, it's, it's a probably a 10 minute installation and, and the access point that you see right above it or the gateway, um, that's a matter of plugging it into a network port and, and door cuber. So uh, there's a huge cost saving on the installation time of a solution like this. Now, with that, that cost saving that you can see there, obviously, either you can, uh, you can save the, the client or the customer costs um, per door cost, um, or you can, for the same spend as what they would have for the wired system, um, you can offer them an additional door. Um, and even with doing that and increasing the installation time of something like that, you can see there's still a huge cost saving and there's still a huge in installation time saving um, that you would be able to get from a, a wired uh, solution, a wireless solution other than um, a wired solution. Okay, so everybody's got an understanding of, of how wireless works. So, so simply stated, a wireless system is a platform which allows um, system data to transmit back to the main panel over wireless signals instead of transmitting over a hardwired um, installation, okay? Um, so a wireless solution between access control points that uses wireless access points must be bi-directional, um, which means more stringent requirements for throughput, latency, uh, and encryption. So we're a wired solution for the peripheral device that include maybe a request to exit device, um, a door position switch, um, and a card reader that's wired to a controller is usually unidirectional, okay? Meaning that they only send a short momentary signal when a credential is presented at the reader. So a wireless solution um, is encrypted and secured between the reader and the wireless network, um, as well as between the door and the user's credential. So um, wireless access uh, control technologies are often categorized by the frequency band that they use. So today, um, access control systems uh, predominantly reside on that 2.4 gigahertz or 900 megahertz bands. Um, many manufacturers offer their own variation within these broad uh, radio frequency categories, uh, making for a, a highly diverse selection of individual technologies that you can choose from. So, for example, um, some offer an alternative uh, an alternative version uh, of open architecture, um, secure Wi-Fi based wireless electronic access control in that 2.4 gigahertz range. And where others then offer a open or proprietary Bluetooth or Zigbee based technology in that 2.4 gigahertz range. Now, um, as these communication protocols have evolved over time, um, there has been a new surge towards using um, Bluetooth with a frequency range of around 2,400 to 2,480 megahertz, um, secured with AES-128 or AES-256 bit encryption. Um, and this is the security factor added to those little boxes. Okay, so 256 is a very high, it's almost a military grade um, uh, of encryption. And the locks themselves also communicate on a wireless radio frequency based on uh, low energy Bluetooth. So um, wireless access solutions can generally also be um, installed and deployed in much, much less time than the traditional wired offerings. Um, and they get the same type of functionality as your hardwired systems. Now, with the locks and their, their ability to do bi-directional communication, um, access rights can actually be stored on the user credential itself. So this would then protect it from um, a network or a power failure, and it also eliminates the need to store these rights within the lock's memory. Um, so should the lock then at any time lose communication with the wireless network, um, they simply write those offline transactions 
to the credential that the user is using, whether it's a card or a phone or a, a tag or whatever it is, um, as opposed to being reliant on the network to carry the data to and from the server. So this concept, concept is called um, data on card. Um, and, and this concept has been proven to be reliable at transferring transactions back to the software um, in instances where redundancy is of the utmost importance in, um, in the events of a power or a network failure. Okay, so but with that said, there is still often um, great concern about the risk of uh, transmitting data wirelessly. Um, however, there's been tremendous efforts um, to protect against, uh, against these dangers. So wireless electronic access control technologies of today are, are highly secure. And like I said previously, they're capable of, of using um, 128 or 256-bit encryption for the protection of the data. Um, and this is all based on the user or the institution's needs. I mean, you don't have to go that high, a security rating, but obviously, for more sensitive places than others, you would need to take a look at the technology um, uh, in the card that you're using for the credential. Okay, so um, wireless versus cloud um, and mobile. <laughs> now, wireless is very different from cloud. Okay, so wireless, like we said previously, wireless is simply a form of communication from one device to another, while your cloud is referring to the ability to manage, configure, update systems remotely from uh, any kind of a device. And this is a hosted solution, okay? So mobile is all about managing, configuring, and using the system from a smartphone or a similar mobile device. So um, mobile apps for access control systems uh, might communicate over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, but this type is not what we're talking about when we refer to a wireless system, okay? Now, while wireless, cloud, and mobile all offer many uh, of the same benefits, uh, they're used in very, diff very different ways. So wireless typically refers to the access control devices connecting to the host system themselves, okay, so that's when we talk about wireless. Cloud-based services um, allow you to store data on services, uh, on servers owned and maintained by uh, third-party companies. So rather than having um, to assume the responsibility for the costs and the maintenance um, and the on-site support and antivirus softwares, uh, updates and backups and things like that, um, your cloud services can be very beneficial to both your integrators, once again, and your end users. Um, especially when it comes to the need for costly infrastructure. So you'll see there with, um, with the, the, the slide in the, right in the middle, the picture in the middle, we've got our wireless locks, they're connecting to an access point, and that is sending that information um, uh, to the cloud server. So nowhere in that whole uh, installation over there do we need to re require any kind of a network. So you're able to either use your existing network or you can use a wireless signal or a 3G signal for that device to send your, your data to the cloud server. So you really don't need a lot of infrastructure for a type of a device like that. Um, the, the very first picture, this is still a, this is a wireless system, but the wireless um, data that it's capturing at that access point is actually sending it to a server. So you're still going to need network infrastructure, you're going to need um, a, 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 a server, that, pres that resides somewhere in that um, in that area or in that site with a database um, that's that's on that server. Okay, so so that's the difference between wireless, cloud, and mobile. And, and then we also have um, another version of mobile. So mobile can also include the use of a smartphone as a credential um, or the use of a phone to commission. Um, access control locks in the field. But uh, more commonly, it is referred to using the mobile um, as a credential to be able to, to open a door and use it for access control. Now, all three of these technologies um, do make access control uh, a lot easier um, and also more affordable and scalable um, at the end of the day. Now, with the, um, the wireless um, 
uh, locks. Uh, there is also an offline mode that you can use these locks in. Um, and we refer to this as data on card. So this platform actually allows you um, to use your offline standalone locks um, to read, receive, and write information from a encrypted secure data on card system that use, utilizes um, the capabilities of RFID's read and write technology. Okay, so with this kind of a platform, all of the access data is stored and distributed by its operating smart card. So whatever type of credential that person has, this is how we transfer the data to and from um, our system, to the locks and back to the system again. Okay, so when presenting a smart card to a offline standalone door, not only does the door control this access rights uh, to that door, but thanks to the two-way communication, the door also writes data like, um, like the blacklist or the time and date stamp um, and the lock's battery status as well. It writes all of that information back to the user's card. Now, the card then transmits this information uh, back to the server or to the software via the online uh, readers um, that are generally connected to controllers um, but that receive this information from the cards um, whenever they scanned on anywhere in the building. Okay, so, so um, I'm going to show you how um, SVN uh, or data on card works. Um, it, it is a movie clip, so I'm just going to ask you to please just turn up your volume. It is a little bit soft. In a conventional access control system, um, generally when we give access to a person or we issue them with a tag, the tag has got a number in it, which we call the UID. So this is a unique identifying number. Now, once the person has been granted access and has been added to the system, the unique identifying number will then be stored in the control unit. Okay. So when the person then goes and presents his badge or his tag to a reader that's connected to a controller, the controller will then verify whether the card number is the same as what is on the controller and based on that and the access given to that user it will allow them access to that area now in using a data on card platform um, we no longer send that information to the control unit instead we write the user access plan straight to the card so the user access card then becomes the data carrier for a system like this so typically we would write an access plan to the card with all of the doors that the user is allowed to access. Now, once we present this card to the lock, two things happen, all right, there's a two-way communication. So once I present my card to the lock, the lock will check my card to see if it is part of my access plan. So if it sees its profile on my card, it will then do another check to see whether I'm scheduled um, to have access at that date and time. Um, and then it will grant me access. Now, at the same time while that's happening, the reader is also writing ex uh, information from itself to the card as well. So things like your time and date stamp that you've accessed that door, um, as well as the lock's battery status. Okay, so at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, fair enough. So I've gone to all of these standalone offline doors um, and I've scanned my card on, on various access points. So uh, on my card, there is a whole bunch of transactions uh, and battery status is for the locks that I've, I've been, been given access to. Um, so how do we then retrieve that data from the card itself? Typically with a data on card solution, you are required to however have one or two or more online access control points. Now, these are generally um, a wall reader or a reader that's connected to a controller and the controller is networked, so it has got a constant connection to the, the database or to the software. So when the user then presents his card at one of these online points, um, the same thing happens again. So the system will then check to see who the user is and whether the user has access to that access point. Um, and at the same time while doing that, it will also then go and retrieve the data off of the card. So all of the doors that I have visited throughout the day, um, and all of the battery statuses that I've collected, um, the online reader will then take that information off of my card and it will make it available um, on the software. Okay, so let's take a look at how uh, our how, how data on card uh, platform works live. 
Right, so I've created a user card. I've also given my user access to this padlock. So this is an electronic uh, uh, padlock, which is an offline standalone lock. It's in no way connected to a wireless network or any other type of a network. Um, and you will see that it's offline um, in the software right below underneath this video. Should I scan on this door and it's actually online, live, um, I'll be able to see the transaction there. But with it being offline, as soon as I go and scan my card, I will then get access granted with the green light. Um, and at the same time, while this lock has now granted me access, it's also written the time and date stamp back to my card, as well as this lock's battery status. Okay, I have another door here, which is my office door. So this door is also offline, um, and the same thing will apply here. So if I go and scan on my door, the door uh, or the door, door is granted me access. Um, and at the same time, once again, it's written the time and date stamp back to my card. Okay. Now, to retrieve this data from the card, we need to then pass an online access point. So this is typically a reader and controller, um, and you can find these access points at high traffic areas like uh, boom gates, turnstiles, uh, maybe a reception door that everybody passes through. Okay, so once I go and present my card to this online controller, I want you to watch the software right underneath um, for the transactions coming in. Um, and you'll see once I scan it there. Right, so the first transaction or from the bottom, you'll see is my padlocks transaction. The very next transaction will then be my offline office door. And then my third transaction is from my slimline in reader that I got at. Okay, so another really great feature about a data on card platform is the way we distribute uh, lost or stolen cards or cancelled cards in the system throughout all of our standalone offline logs. Now, um, here I've got three user cards, John, Jim, and Jerry. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we carry this blacklist from the system or from a live access point to all of our offline doors. Okay, so let's say, for instance, John has lost his card. Now, in the meantime, while this card has not been blacklisted or the lock has not uh, received the blacklist, John is able to scan on this door and he's able to get access, all right? Because it is a standalone lock, so it doesn't know that the card is lost yet. But let's say, for instance, Jim um, comes in to the online access point in the morning, right? So we scan his card. So what's happened now is Jim's card has actually gone and picked up the blacklist um, and that blacklist card it belongs to John, all right? So what Jim is now going to do is he's going to go to the, the offline office door, right? So when Jim goes and scans his card over here, he gets access and at the same time, he's downloading the blacklist to the lock as well, all right? Now, let's say Jim never gets to the padlock. So uh, Jim then goes off site um, and then Jerry comes along. So Jerry has also not passed the online access point, but even though he hasn't passed that, that point, the blacklist is still sitting on the offline um, office door. So once Jerry then goes and scans on the offline office door, he picks up the blacklist on his card. And when he goes and scans it on the padlock, he will then download it on the padlock. So there we go and scan on our pet block. Right, so should John's card ever show up? Let's say somebody picks it up, uh, it, it was found again, and somebody tries to use that card at the pet block where John had access before, it will then deny him access. Okay, so what happens is the lock will actually erase the access control plan that is sitting on John's card. Okay, so another really unique feature of a standalone system um, is the ability to grant access to users um, and not having to bring their cards back to the system operator. Okay, so like I said, the, the access plan is written on the card. So basically all we need to do is update the access plan. And this we can do at any online point. So to give you an example, this padlock, my user Jim, when he scans on the padlock, you'll see that he doesn't have access to this padlock. Um, when he also goes and scans on the, the offline office door, there's no access given to him because he doesn't have the rights to go into those doors. Now, for a, 
the data on card system, basically all that they need to do is phone the operator or speak to the operator um, that's administering the software, um, ask them to uh, give them additional access uh, to the doors that they need, and then all the user needs to do is go to his closest or nearest online update point, uh, scan his card, and then you'll be able to have access to those doors. So just to show you how that works, I'm going to take my card now, scan it at an online point so that I can update the access plan on my card. So once I've scanned it, it's now updated the access plan on my card. And if Jim now goes and tries to scan on the padlock where he didn't have access before, you'll see that his access is now granted. Okay, the same applies for our offline door. When I go and scan on the door immediately, Jim will have access um, to those additional access points. So that basically is a data on card system in a nutshell. Okay, so um, I hope that explanation of your, your data on card platform um, was sufficient and you guys have an idea of how we transfer the data by using the user's card instead of a network. So this is just uh, one of the other um, advantages of going with a wireless system. Um, because remember, at the end of the day, if we talk about wireless, we say that these locks are actually online and they're connected. But in the event of a network failure and these access points can no longer see the doors, the doors will then automatically write this data to the user card itself. So there's no need to update um, the, the, the user card or the, the, the lock itself. Um, all these transactions will be written to the user card and when they pass, when the network comes back online again and they pass an online network point, they can scan their card there to retrieve all of this information. Okay, so we're going to get back to our, um, our eight fundamental questions uh, that you need to ask before scoping or preparing an access control system for a business. Okay, and, and the, the first question that we went through was what are the benefits and is it worth it? So, you know, while, while these electronic systems provide a lot of benefits over the keys, um, they are going to cost thousands more per door than a normal key in a lock. So as such, you may then determine uh, that the cost of an electronic system cannot be justified uh, or that only certain doors are worth installing um, access control on. So once again, what do you secure? Okay, uh, nine out of 10 times, like I said, the perimeter is the most important. Um, and is the first line of defense against any unauthorized access or controlling any external threats um, on any given site. Now, often more focus is given to these access points, um, as well as increased resources. For instance, if you have, uh, and this is more for stricter control, so the addition of turnstiles and spike barriers, uh, number plate recognition, CCTV, um, and all of these things can be added to, to, to access control points, and it's just another way to increase the security for places like this. Okay. Now, once these measures have been passed, um, the site is generally open to all, and you have freedom to move around uh, within the site. So, once the site security um, has been taken care of, you will also then need to mitigate the level of risk for each internal area um, and the value of what you're trying to protect within that site. Um, and these can be things like uh, storage equipment, money, sensitive data. Um, and then you also need to take into account um, compliance to health and safety regulations um, for areas that might, for instance, uh, be hazardous to health and things. Okay, so you can see from my slide over there, you know, I've, I've got a couple of access points um, in there that have different um, security, security levels. So for instance, your server room, and typically this is a sensitive area which is normally out of bounds to employees, uh, but can contain um, a very expensive IT equipment. So uh, this would be a high, high level or a high risk area. Um, lift control. So what's nice about the lift control is we can now use the lift control as well to secure um, certain floors that may be sensitive or um, uh, more critical than others. Um, and then right underneath that, obviously personal security, I've mentioned this uh, just now, that you need to ensure your employer and employee well-being and security at all times. 
Um, and this is generally also one of the reasons why people put access controls into buildings, especially in our uh, in our country where, where we've got a bit of an issue with it. Um, so that is also another factor uh, to take into account. Then um, you'll see at the top right hand side, we've got our staff offices. Now I put a low risk on this. Uh, generally, you know, a staff uh, person's office only might contain a computer or a laptop and all the, the rest of the things inside that office of, my, of value might be personal items, okay. Uh, your boardrooms, so in most institutions, um, they've got very expensive audio-visual equipment, um, polycoms uh, for uh, voice over IP and, and, and things like that. And, and then there's also often sensitive data. You might, might not think of it this way, but you know, when you have a meeting, there is sometimes sensitive data that you might write on the whiteboard uh, or things like that. And, and those, those areas are generally access control as well. Um, a storeroom. Definitely a high-risk area. Uh, they normally contain high-value items uh, or personal data or com company information that is very sensitive. Um, then right underneath that, we've got our, our emergency exits. Now, uh, emergency exits are normally unidirectional. Okay, so you can only go out. That's what the exits are for. Um, so, so can this door be operated from the outside as well? Because with with um, the, the, the wireless solutions that are available today, you can actually put um, a half a discussion on the outside of that fire door, making that door um, an access control door as opposed to just an emergency exit. Um, now, with the addition of that discussion, you can also then monitor the door state wirelessly as well, um, which is really nice. I mean, if you've got an alarm system in a building um, that you normally switch on every day, you would need to ensure that all of your perimeter doors uh, are closed before you can do that. Now, uh, typically these fire doors are pretty much standalone devices and nobody really worries about them because nobody uses them. Um, but adding a half inch discussion to the outside of the door, um, you can then make this door wireless and, and online in real time um, as well. Okay. Um, and then right underneath that, your electrical uh, service panels or cabinets. Okay, so I should, I should have probably made this also, also a high risk. Uh, you know, these panels obviously, well, they often contain um, the power TV boards and things like that for a business. Um, and most, for most businesses, it is critical to have electricity in network most of the time. Um, so, yeah, you could, you could also control these cabinets, however, with um, uh, electronic uh, geo cylinders and things like that that are also wireless. So you can monitor real time events from these. Um, from these cabinets. Okay, so um, your, your forms of authentication. So there are many forms of credentials um, that you can use in an access control scenario. Um, and there's a huge range of technologies also to choose from. So some of the credentials are more secure than others. Um, and they have different data capacity sizes for multiple applications. So for instance, if you're not just using it for your building's access control, but you have a canteen as well, and you would like to use that card for a type of a, a money wallet application, um, there's enough space on those cards for that as well. Um, so, I mean, you know, looking at the screen here, yes, just a few, um, uh, a, a few different versions of uh, types of credentials that you can use. So there's things like your smart cards or your credit card type credential. That's probably the most common um, uh, in today's world. And you get them in different technologies, uh, different sizes and things. And then right underneath that, you can also use um, key fobs. Um, and then underneath that, we've got bracelets. Uh, so those are silicon rubber bracelets, which are 100% waterproof. Um, we've also got um, little straps with tags that you can put around your arms like a little bracelet. Um, and these are generally um, uh, classified under the wearables. Um, so with the readers now being able to communicate via Bluetooth and NFC, um, the smartphone and the smart smartwatch has now become uh, your key that most people aren't likely to lose or leave lying around or forget at home. Okay, so and also with those types of technologies, um, you eliminate that recurring cost of tags and cards and, and things like that. 
you know, for people to lose a card, it's not a major issue. They'll come back, they'll say, you know, I genuinely lost my card. That's okay, we'll issue you the new card. But at the end of the day, those cards uh, are anything between 30 and 50 Rand a card, depending on the type of technology. So that is a recurring cost that you completely eliminate when you go for a mobile route where they use their mobile device um, as their key. Okay, so um, one of the other questions in our eight fundamentals was authentication. So authentication is very important and uh, there are different modes to consider. So there are single modes of, of authentication um, and then there are multiple modes to consider. So for instance, in a, a general area or an office with low security risks, um, it will only require one mode of authentication. Where, where other areas um, could require maybe two or even three different credentials to be presented before access is granted um, to an area or a door. Um, so generally these uh, credentials can be categorized as follows. So the first category we have there is, is something you have, right? So this could be a, um, a normal credit card type credential or a key fob. Um, a mobile device or a, a smartwatch. Okay, then it's something that you are. So this can either be a, a biometric template uh, from a fingerprint reader, or this can be um, a, a facial template from a facial recognition scanner. And then something you know. So um, this can be a, um, it's typically a PIN code or a combination code, uh, something like that. And in combination, um, these credentials need to be presented in a sequence um, all together for a successful authentication. And this is known as your, um, your multiple mode authentication uh, solutions. Okay, so in that multi factor, there I've got an example of either your, your card and a PIN, or your mobile device and a biometric template, um, or a PIN code and a key fob. And this is all. Um, to make that access control point a little bit more secure. Okay. Okay, so then the question comes up, what, what kind of a reader should you use? Um, and, and all depending on the environment where the reader will be installed, um, you will need to make sure that it can withstand the elements. Um, and also, as well as being compliant with any security or health and safety regulations as well. So obviously everybody knows with, uh, with the current uh, pandemic, more focus has been put on a contactless reader type of a solution um, that doesn't require the user to touch any surface that might be contaminated uh, by a previous user, you know, such as like a, a hand punch, which is a very old terminal, but it requires you to, to insert your whole hand. Um, or a biometric terminal, okay, which can also contain uh, uh, germs and viruses from the previous user. Okay, so you'll see in the examples um, that I have here, um, on the slide we have sliding doors, um, we've got boom gates, lift control, um, and, and turnstiles. Okay, so generally these types of access points require um, a relay or a contact to be sent to the control module of the motor to trigger a solenoid or to action the motor. Okay, so nine out of 10 times, um, this will be a hardwired reader and controller solution. Okay, so, I mean, predominantly we are also, we, we're, a, we're a wireless, wire-free access control uh, company, but we do have these wired solutions. There is just, in some instances, there is just no way to get away from uh, this kind of a solution when you're looking at, at wiring a, a boom gate or a turnstile or something like that. Okay, so to the right of that, we have our, our common um, hinged doors. So this can either be an entrance uh, or an internal door um, or a, uh, an office door. Um, and and will be driven by the discussion or the handle to engage a mortise lock that actually sits inside the door, um, retracting the latch and the deadbolt. Okay, so this deadbolt and the latch, um, latch into the door frame itself. So this is just a, 
the standard way that any other door works um, that you find today. So, so basically that is showing you that you can take um, an electronic wireless uh, discussion and even, even if you want to use the existing lock that's, that's still inside the door, um, you can use the existing lock and you basically just put this handle onto the door to, to have that door access control. Okay. So um, you'll see as well, we've got a fire door there. So in many cases, um, they are unidirectional. Uh, and it's an exit door and you're not able to access the door from the outside. So I did mention this a little bit earlier on. Um, with the addition of a wireless online half discussion on the outside of the door, you can now use this door as an entry point as well for your maintenance staff or emergency personnel. Um, and another advantage of adding this, the, the wireless capabilities uh, to an existing emergency exit is that you can now also monitor this door state wirelessly as well. Um, and, and you know, often these doors are overlooked um, and are assumed to be closed, but in some cases uh, they aren't, and they leave a huge gap in, in the security of a building. Um, so these solutions can be fitted to probably about 90% of existing uh, fire or emergency exit doors um, that exist today with the discussion and the mortises um, in, a, in a retrofit um, scenario. So both the, the discussion sitting on the outside and the mortise lock that goes in the door um, uh, are also fire rated as well. So it's a fire, it's emergency exit door and those doors are normally fire rated. So it would only make sense that the hardware that you put on the door needs a fire rating as well. Okay. Right, so looking at our last example here at the bottom, um, this is a, a typical mortise cylinder kind of a lock, and you find these a lot in SA, um, especially on your aluminium doors, um, you'll have these kind of locks. Um, so we have many of these locks in SA, and securing things like security gates and trailer doors and garage doors and sliding gates, and here I'm specifically talking about the cylinder inside the door. Um, uh, we've even got them on electronic uh, key switches for roller shutter doors. Okay, this is just to name a few. So these doors are very easy to secure with a wireless um, online solution as the only thing you need to do for a door like that is to remove the existing cylinder and just replace it with an electronic cylinder. So, so the examples I have here are for your standard cylinder um, and key type of a door. So this can either be replaced with an discussion handle, uh, that's probably the easiest, or actually um, the cylinder would be the easiest, or you can just remove the cylinder itself and pop in a new cylinder. Okay, so and in, a, in a case like that, where you just remove the cylinder and put an electronic cylinder in, the handle still will stay as it is on that door. Okay, um, and then I also have an example to the right of that. So that is uh, your, common, um, your common server racks, um, and they are normally secured uh, with keys. Okay, so same thing applies, uh, depending on what profile it is, and these electronic locks don't, they can come in different profiles, whether it's oval, UK, Scandinavian, uh, European. Um, so all that you do is simply slip up the cylinder uh, out of the, the handle and slip in the electronic cylinder. So what's nice about that is, and especially in a, in a hosted environment where You've got all of these different types of all these different servers belonging to different companies. Uh, the technicians would obviously go there to service those servers and things. And instead of now giving them access to the whole data center, um, you're able to give them access to a specific server rack to ensure the security um, of those of those uh, servers. Okay. So, like I said, the cylinders come in many different shapes and forms. You can get a whole bunch of a whole range of them, um, but they do they really versatile in in the all the applications that you can apply these locks to. Okay, um, right. So, what kind of a lock should I use? So, previously I also referred to when I was speaking of these these eight fundamental questions. I said that. You know, when they refer to the lock here, they're talking about the locking mechanism that is keeping um, the door closed. Okay, so once again, um, 
this is all dependent on the door and the area um, that you are installing it in and the security level needed um, per access location um, as you may also need a mix of different, uh, different solutions to mitigate that risk factor. Now, there are various types of locks <coughs> that range in security level, um, as well as different fire and safety ratings. Now, for the access points that require a contact or a relay, um, to open, we generally don't uh, need a lock for that, but we rather need, uh, we rather send this um, to the motor controller itself. Um, but for doors like main reception doors and entrance doors um, and things like that, that you're not able to fix a handle to, you will be required to install a magnetic lock uh, or an st uh, electric strike lock or an electric deadbolt. Now, often these are uh, powered by external power sources. Um, so for internal doors like office doors and fire doors, and, and basically any standard type of an operating door, you do require a mortise lock inside that door that latches to the door frame uh, to keep the door secure. So just keep in mind as well, like I said earlier on, um, you don't have to replace the, the lock inside or the mortise lock inside the door. Um, these wireless solutions fit to many of these uh, locks that are currently in circulation uh, in today. Um, right, then you also see this mortise lock, uh, this example that I have here. So uh, in the previous slide, we said that we are able to either take off this handle and fit it with something like a, an escutcheon. Um, but if you want to go to the geo cylinder route, I mean, it's as easy as removing the cylinder and the cylinder will be inserted here so that when you scan on this door lock and you turn the cylinder, it retracts the deadbolt and the latch. Okay. Right. So, um, so, so what do you need at the door besides the reader and the lock? Now, um, we went through um, a couple of examples of the different elements that you need. Um, to secure a door other than the, the reader and the lock, okay? And this will all be dependent on the solution that you decide to, to go with. So obviously some solutions require less hardware than others um, to achieve the same level of security. Okay, so, and then also the next question um, is, how do you connect a reader to the network? So typically the reader uh, there, there's two options here. So the reader is either wired to a controller um, uh, or the, 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 the lock is wireless and it's communicating wirelessly with its access point that is connected to a network. Um, so the wireless options available are typically wire free um, and work on a wireless RF or Bluetooth communication signal. Um, and that is to the access point that resides on your network that manages the communication to the database or the software um, from the lock. Okay, so what type, of, um, what type of access control management systems um, should you use, uh, local or cloud-based? So um, with the locals, look, there are benefits to both options um, with, with cost, uh, installation time, uh, architecture requirements, your power and network infrastructure limitations, and all of these things uh, you need to consider. And, and another thing you need to consider is also the size of the organization um, and the amount of doors that you want to secure, um, as well as the, the level that you're trying to achieve. So um, a lot of time, you know, with a server-based solution uh, or an on-premise solution, um, you, you are required to have a license for these systems. So the license would allow you a certain amount of users on that system. Uh, you would then need to go and expand the license. And, and very often um, on, a, on a wide solution where you have a wide controller, um, these controllers also have a limitation to the amount of people um, whose, whose credentials can be stored on those controllers. So typically with a wireless system, um, you don't have those limitations because the, the, the lock itself on the door or the handle um, doesn't actually store the user information on the lock because we're using the data on card platform with these systems. So each and every person's access plan is written to his card. The lock doesn't save any of that information on the lock itself. So because of that, 
um, I can, you can have a total of 4 million users um, uh, going through a lock. There's, there's no real limitation to the amount of users you can have per lock. Um, so with a cloud-based solution, also something to keep in mind that, um, that a cloud-based solution normally requires you to have, um, a, it's normally a per user license kind of scenario. So when you're looking at, at buildings, big buildings that have many doors and many people, um, you know, when you, when you weigh up the costs, it's just not going to make sense to go to something um, cloud-based. You would rather then look at an on-premise solution, an on-premise wireless solution um, for something like that. Okay, so, um, so with these wireless locks, um, there is also an ability to, uh, well, with our current situation that we have, um, uh, it also allows you to coat these, these, um, these wireless access points um, and even some of the plastic wall readers, uh, gym lockers, things like that we normally find or that's normally in a kind of a germy environment. Um, these locks are also, you can also coat them in an, uh, an antimicrobial um, technology that helps reduce the microbes on the product surface and improves um, the hygiene in these environments. Um, so this technology is, uh, it delivers a 99.9% 24-7 protection um, against an array of microbes including your influenza, uh, H1N1, E. coli, Salmonella, MRSA, and then also a feline strain of the coronavirus. Okay, so it doesn't, doesn't uh, kill the coronavirus, but uh, there's a feline strain of it that it does manage. Okay, so this is a lifelong coating that gets applied to the surface um, and it stays there. And, and obviously when you, when, you, when you grab the handle or something like that, when you, when you put your handle on it, um, any point of contact where you've had with the handle, it will kill the germs on that handle so that when the next person comes past um, and grabs the same handle again, that they don't cross infect or carry the virus or, or, or whatever the case is. Okay. Thank you very much, Roger. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be taking questions now. Please, I encourage you to uh, ask your questions in the question panel, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, Roger, I've got a few questions here from our attendees. Uh, one question from Mr. Viv Kroener. Can one gain access to a New York's padlock protected entrance without mobile network coverage? Yes, um, yes, you can. So, so the process of that is when you give a person access um, uh, to that padlock, you actually send the digital key, the binary format key to his phone. Um, and even though that lock is offline and not connected to any type of a network, when I present my phone to the lock, it pr pretty much works the same as a card. So it reads that binary key from my phone and it then allows me access. So even if I've got that lock sitting out in the sticks, um, I never have to update that lock at all. Um, the mobile phone will be the credential that has the access plan on it. Excellent, thank you. We've got a, a question here from, um, sorry, Gretzler Ditzwey, who's asking how efficient are the wireless system in high EMC environments like substations? Yes, yeah, so I mean, depending on what type of a communication you go, go with, um, so there's two options um, in the wireless uh, space. So you can either use uh, the RF2 uh, communication or you can use Bluetooth. Now, I mean, RF2 is susceptible to, to um, the same type of stuff that a wireless access point, for instance, is susceptible to. So where, anywhere where you have, um, you know, uh, thick concrete with rebar in um, or glass that the, that the RF signal can bounce from, um, or any type of a metallic surface, if that access point is, is mounted on a, um, or not, not the, the, the lock itself, but the, the gateway or the node that it's talking to, um, if that is mounted on a metallic surface, there is often interference with that. So you do need to take uh, into account where you're installing these devices uh, um, so that it doesn't create any interference um, uh, to the lock itself. Great, thank you. And our last question for this afternoon is from Mr. Andrew Akwamuchi, 
asking when a card is misplaced or lost, is there a geolocation of the card's functionality? Uh, no, there isn't. Um, these cards are just normal, uh, you know, they, they are smart cards in a sense, but for that to be able to give you a data location, it's got to have, it's got to be powered up um, in some way. Um, but the way that you manage lost cards on a system like that is you can have a revalidation re function, which will, um, which will automatically cancel that card within a certain period of time if the card hasn't been scanned or used in, let's say, a 24-hour period. So to answer the question more shortly, no, nope, it doesn't give you geolocation, but there is a way that those, can those cards are cancelled from the system um, automatically. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this, this brings us now to the end of our webinar today. You'll see on the screen uh, Roger Birch's details, his email, r.birch at saltosystems.com. If you have any, any questions uh, that we didn't get to uh, during this webinar, please contact him directly. Um, Roger, thank you very much for availing yourself today for giving us this presentation. I thank you to all the attendees for joining us. Please subscribe to the SIE TV. The link is in the chat box. And if you want to become a member of the SIE and start reaping the benefits, please also there's a join link there on and find out more information about what the SIE membership involves. I thank you all for attending today. Have a good evening and have a good day further. Goodbye.